Friday we talked about two forces, the weight of an object, which is the force of gravity acting on the object, and the normal force, which is your apparent weight, or the force of the floor, the ground, the track, whatever it is that's pushing at 90 degrees. Today I want to talk about another kind of force. In fact, I want to talk about two subcategories of that force, we call it friction. The two subcategories are what we call static friction and kinetic friction. First, let's talk about static friction. Static friction is that force of friction. Friction, by the way, is a resistive force that resists motion. But specifically, static friction is that force of friction that acts to prevent an object from beginning to move. Right now, the desk in front of Simon is at rest. There is no friction acting on this desk. There's no need for friction acting on this desk. There's gravity and there's a normal force. But if I push this desk with a force of, say, 5 newtons, and it doesn't move, then something has to be countering that 5 newtons. What is it? Friction. We call it static friction because it was 5 newtons that was acting against my 5 newton force to prevent it from beginning to move. Now, if I push on this desk with a force of 10 newtons and it doesn't move, still we have static friction. What's the value of static friction? 10 newtons. Static friction is whatever it has to be to oppose my force. If I push with 10 newtons and it doesn't move, then static friction must be 10 newtons to balance the force that I'm pushing with. Yep. Is, uh, static yeah, in that case, static friction would be the only force opposing it. There, there are situations where it could be something else, like wind resistance or... Yeah, unless you're given some more information, then yes, you would just assume that it was static friction. Okay, now, that doesn't, mean that, that doesn't mean that I can't beat static friction. Hey, sometimes I can. Watch. <laughs> Push the desk. Look, it moves. It's not static friction once it's moving. Okay, if I overcome static friction, and I can do that in some situations, then that means we've got another kind of friction called kinetic friction we'll talk about in just a second. But for now, static friction is whatever that force of friction is that's opposing the force that I'm applying to prevent it from moving in the first place. Yep. Yep. Okay, that's good. That's a really good question, actually. So if I lift the desk up a little bit, but it's still touching the ground, okay, then and I push it, what does that do? Well, it reduces the value that static friction can act. There's a maximum value that static friction can act at. Okay, I pushed it with five newtons, it didn't move. I pushed it with ten newtons, didn't move. Push it with sixteen newtons, oh, it moves. Maybe the set ma maximum force of static friction was. 15. You're going to learn how to find that maximum value here soon. But for now, just trust me, say it's 15 newtons. If I lift up on it a little bit and then push it, well, now maybe the maximum force of static friction is 8. So now maybe all I have to do is push it with 8 to get it moving. Whereas before, I had to push it with 15 or more to get it moving. Make sense? I mean, in the end, if I lift it up a little bit, uh, the normal force doesn't have to be as big because I'm helping the normal force out, right? And force of friction is dependent upon other things, including the normal force. Force of friction that prevents an object from beginning to move. Now, that force of static friction, as we saw in the little example that I just gave you, varies with the applied force. I push with 5 newtons, desk doesn't move. Push with 10, desk doesn't move. Static friction had to be 5 and 10 to counter my applied force. I push with 15, desk doesn't move. Static friction must be 15. I push with 19. Desk doesn't move. Static friction must be 19. It's a stubborn force. It pushes as hard as it needs to push just to be a pain in my butt. Okay, I push with 19 newtons. It pushes with 19 newtons. It pushes as hard as it needs to to counter my force until it reaches a maximum. There is a maximum at which you can't push any harder. So then if I overcome that maximum, well, then the desk starts moving. It's a pain in the butt force until at some point it just gives up and says, all right, you win. Now we're going to have kinetic friction. We're going to allow you to move. Go ahead. Yeah. 
that expression only acts parallel to the surface. So if the surface is parallel, then it would only act horizontal. But if you're on an incline like this, then friction would act parallel to that incline. Yep. No, static friction would actually be less on an incline than it would be uh, on a floor. And the reason is, and you're going to see in a few minutes in the equation, it's going to depend upon the normal force. Now, if, if I go back to, remember I drew that diagram of the normal force acting on somebody here versus the normal force acting on somebody here, right? Gravity is the same in both cases, but the normal force ends up being less on this guy than it ends up being on this guy. And because the normal force is less here, then that would mean friction would actually be a less value as well. Okay. We'll deal with that though over the next over the coming days here. So the force of static friction is that stubborn force, that pain in the butt force. It it's exactly equal to however hard I'm pushing until it reaches the maximum value. So let's say the maximum value of static friction on this desk is 20, and I push with 5. It pushes back with 5. I push with 10, it pushes back with 10. I push with 15, it pushes back with 15. I push with 19, it pushes back with 19. I push with 21, it gives up. Because the maximum value is 20, it can't do 21, so it just says you win. Now you got kinetic friction. It's exactly equal to the applied force until it reaches the maximum value and then it gives up the object begins to move and now we're not dealing with static friction anymore because the object is moving we're dealing with kinetic friction push with five doesn't move push with 10 doesn't move push with 15 doesn't move push with 19 doesn't move push with 21 now it's kinetic friction and it moves What's interesting here, though, is that the force of kinetic friction is less than the maximum value of static. So 5, 10, 15, 19, I push with 21, now it's kinetic friction, and kinetic friction might have a value of, say, 12. Not necessarily less than, than, than the 10 newtons that I was applying before, but less than the maximum value of static friction that was 20. Kinetic friction is that force of friction. By the way, we also call kinetic friction dynamic friction. Sometimes I like to not call it, but think of it as sliding friction. It's the force of friction that acts against an object that's already moving. Static friction keeps the desk from moving. Kinetic friction resists the motion once I've got it moving. Kinetic friction is not a pain in the butt force. Kinetic friction is a, it's a force that kind of just says, look, this is what I am. Okay, I'm happy with what I am. If I'm 12 newtons, then I'm going to stay 12 newtons. I push on that desk with 19 newtons, static friction is 19. I push on the desk with 21 newtons, static friction is zero, and kinetic friction becomes say 12. I push on it with 30 newtons, static friction is 0, kinetic friction is 12. I push on it with 10,000 newtons, static friction is 0, kinetic friction is 12. So static friction gets bigger as I push harder. Kinetic friction, once it's acting, just acts at the same value. But the force of kinetic friction is lower than the maximum force of static friction. The word maximum is in italics, right? Because it's not that static friction is greater than kinetic friction. It's that static friction maximum is greater than kinetic friction. I pushed on the desk with 5, it didn't move, static friction was 5. I pushed on it with 21, it did move, kinetic friction was 12. Kinetic friction was bigger than static friction. 
But what was the maximum force of static friction? 20. The kinetic friction is smaller than the maximum value of 20. Let's say we find the maximum value. Question here? Yeah. Let's say we find the maximum value of static friction to be 50 newtons. Now, don't worry about how we're going to find that value. Let's say that you have a way to find the maximum value, and it's 50 newtons. That means if I push with a force below 50 newtons, static friction will, that stubborn pain in the butt force, will respond to that. It's going to push as hard as it needs to push until I exceed 50 newtons. So if I push with less than 50, it's not going to move. If I push with more than 50, I win, it moves. Let's create a little table here. My applied force in newtons, the force of static friction in newtons, and the force of kinetic friction in newtons. Let's say I have an applied force of 20 newtons. What's static friction force going to be? The pain in the butt, do what I do for us, 20 newtons. What's kinetic friction going to be? Zero, because it doesn't move. Kinetic friction only acts when something's moving, right? Okay, I push with a force of 35 newtons. What's static friction going to be? That pain in the butt force of static friction is going to do whatever I do until it exceeds the maximum value. So it's going to be 35 newtons. What's kinetic friction going to be? Zero, because it doesn't move. I push with 49 newtons. What's static friction going to be? 49 newtons. That pain in the butt force does whatever I do until I exceed the maximum value. Static friction is 49 newtons. Kinetic friction is zero because it doesn't move. I apply a force of 51 newtons. What's the force of static friction, Max? Yeah, go ahead. We'll deal with that in a minute here, okay? Push with 51 newtons. What's the set force of static friction? Zero. Okay, static friction gave up. That pain in the butt force said, okay, I stayed with you until we got to 50, and then I just, I can't go any harder. So it gives up. Now what happens? The object moves. Now we've got kinetic friction. And kinetic friction, we could calculate its value as well. We'll just make one up, though, right now. Let's say it's about 32 newtons. You could calculate that value if you had more information. Push with 60 newtons. What's the static friction? Static friction says, look, I gave up 10 newtons ago. Yeah, I'm not going to act on it now. It's moving. I'm done. What's the force of kinetic friction? 32 newtons. Because remember, it's not a pain in the butt force. It's that constant, listen, I'm happy, I'm happy with who I am force. I'm 32 newtons, and I'm happy with that. I'm happy being 32 newtons. Say I apply a force of 100 newtons. Static friction is zero. Kinetic friction is 32 newtons. Say I apply a force of... 10,000 newtons. Static friction is zero. Static friction is like, there's no way I'm going to do that. Most I can apply is 50. I'm not even going to try. Kinetic friction is, listen, I'm happy being 32. You guys, see what's, ha what's happening here? This pain in the butt force of static friction keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I push harder and harder and harder until we reach the maximum value, which we could calculate, and then it gives up, and it's never going to show its ugly face again. Now it's kinetic friction. And kinetic friction, it's frustrating sometimes because it, it resists motion, but at least we know what we're going to get. At least we don't have to keep pushing harder and harder and harder like we do when we're trying to beat static friction. Now, one more little thing, and then I'm going to answer Max's question, okay? You guys ever notice that when you, go to, when you push something, sometimes it's really hard to, to get it moving? But that once you get it moving, it's like, oh, it's sliding across the floor more easily. It kind of surprised you a little bit about how easy it was once you got it going. It's harder to get something moving than it is to keep it moving. Why? Well, because I had to apply 50 newtons to get it moving, right? 
How much do I have to apply to keep it moving? I just have to overcome 32 now. I had to overcome 50 to get it moving. I have to overcome 32 to keep it moving. Make sense? Yeah, Max, what was your question? What, what if it's at 50 newtons? We say the maximum force of static friction is 50 newtons. If I apply a force of exactly 50, it doesn't move because the maximum static is, is 50. I have to overcome that. So 50.1, 50.03, like technically above 50 gets it moving. Now, um, I'm not going to give you a question. I purposely skipped the 50 there. I'm purposely not going to, and I, and I won't give you a question that involves a number that's that close to it, okay? Um, technically, it, 50, it has to exceed that 50, not just get to that 50. 50 plus gets it moving. 50 and below doesn't get it moving. Yep, another question? No, but that's a good question too. Um, you could get a question like that, but the time would be irrelevant. Okay? If I apply a force of 20 newtons for one second. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll deal with that. Let me get to that here in a second here. Good question. Apply a force of 20 newtons for one second, what happens? Doesn't move. Apply a force of 20 newtons for 10 seconds, what happens? Doesn't move. Apply a force of 20 newtons for six years, what happens? It doesn't move. Okay, because it doesn't it doesn't matter how long I apply force. It's not cumulative. Okay, it's the force that acts at a given moment. If it doesn't exceed the maximum force, it doesn't move. Period. Now, if I apply a force of 20 newtons for 10 seconds, and then I apply a force of 51 newtons, okay, we get two separate problems there. The force of 20 newtons caused nothing. The problem really begins at the moment that I started applying the force of 51 newtons, because that's when it's going to start moving. There'd be two separate problems there, and we'd probably be concerned about the one that caused the movement. Um, well, yes, but you won't get a problem where involving energy, which does come later on in the unit. Um, but you won't get a problem where there's, where there's varying forces, not in physics 20, or physics 30 for that matter. The force will be the force in an energy problem. It becomes too complicated if you're switching that up. Okay. All right. So how do we get those values of forces? How do we get that 32 newtons for kinetic friction, or or that 50 newton for the maximum value of static friction? Well, we're going to see two new equations today. The first one. It's going to look a little bit weird, actually, the number of subscripts that you're going to see here. The force of static friction max, FSF max. Force of static friction max. Say that five times fast. FSF max. We are not finding the force of friction with this equation that I'm about to show you. We are not finding the 20 or the 35 or the 49. Okay, this equation will not get me those values. This equation will get me the 50 Newton maximum force. I don't need these values because these values are just how hard I push until I exceed the maximum value. Okay, this equation gets me this value right here, the maximum value of static friction. It's going to be equal to it's a Greek letter mu. It's kind of a cross between an M and a U. And it's called mu. It stands for a variable that we call the coefficient of static friction. There are no units. It's not kilograms or newtons or meters. There are no units. It's a measure of how much two things stick together. Rubber and ice has a very low coefficient of static friction. Rubber on pavement has a much higher coefficient of static friction. Because rubber on pavement stick together, rubber and pavement stick together a lot more than rubber and ice do, right? The higher the number, the more the two things stick together, the bigger the maximum force of static friction will be. The bigger this value, will be 
the higher the coefficient of static friction. Now FSF max is equal to mu time mu uh, s times Fn. What do you think Fn stands for? The normal force, the force pushing at 90 degrees to the surface. Now, for now, let me label that first here. It's the normal force. And for now, the normal force will be equal to gravity, which is m times g, m times 9.81. That's not always going to be the case. But I'll make sure that I tell you when it's not the case. Okay, I'll help you to understand why it's not the case when we get to a problem like that. For now, gravity is pulling down with 10 times 9.81. Then the ground is pushing up with 10 times 9.81, same as gravity is pulling down. One last little thing with this equation. Notice the absolute value signs here. The little vertical lines. These just mean that any signs we get, positives, negatives, we drop them. The equation isn't going to tell me the direction. It's just going to tell me how big the force is, the magnitude. So any signs, positives, negatives. Negative 9.81? No, no. When you're finding the normal force, just make it mass times positive 9.81. Drop the signs. Get the magnitude only. Here's another one, FKF, a little bit easier to say because there's no maximum. This would correspond, by the way, to the 32, right? The force of kinetic friction once it's moving. FKF is equal to mu K, which is the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. Now, mu s will almost always be bigger than mu k, and f f s f s f. You know what I'm trying to say. F s f max will almost always be bigger than f k f. Remember, go back to this. The force of kinetic friction is 32. The force of static friction was sometimes lower than that. But the maximum force of static friction was higher than the 32. The maximum value is bigger than kinetic. Almost always. It'll never be smaller. Sometimes it'll be to the right number of significant figures equal. It's almost always bigger. The maximum value is almost always bigger than the value of kinetic friction. And that's why it's easier to keep something moving than it is to get something moving. Okay. Pushing on that car, right? Trying to push that car. It's hard to get it moving. Once you get it moving, it wants to keep moving. It's harder to keep, it's easier to keep it moving than it is to get it moving. Okay. Here's a little table. You don't need to write this down or memorize any of these numbers. I don't have these numbers memorized. I don't expect you to memorize them either. Any numbers like this that you need to be given on a quiz or a test, you'll be given on a quiz or a test. Maybe not in the form of a table. Maybe it'll be just in a word problem, but you'll have the numbers. Take a look at some of the different materials that we have rubbing against each other, though. Copper against copper. You see that copper against copper has a really big coefficient of friction. Notice that static friction is quite a bit bigger than kinetic friction. That's usually the case. Go down here to, let's say, rubber tire on, on dry asphalt, dry pavement. Static friction 1.2, kinetic friction 0 0.8. Okay. Rubber tire on wet pavement. Oh, look, the coefficient of static and kinetic friction go down quite dramatically. You ever notice, if you drive a car, do you ever notice that on wet pavement, it's harder to maintain control? You should slow down on wet pavement because friction is smaller because they don't stick together as well. What about on ice, rubber tire on ice? You can see that the coefficient of friction goes like, like exponentially down, right? And that's why it's clearly harder to drive on ice than it is on pavement. Notice the coefficient of static is higher. 
How many people drive here? What do you not want to do if you if you find yourself on ice and you have no traction and you're going a little bit too fast maybe and you find yourself losing control? What do you not want to do? Do not slam on the brakes. Okay, do not lock your brakes. Remember we called, remember we said kinetic friction, we don't really call kinetic friction sliding friction, but I said I like to think of it as sliding friction. When your brakes lock, you've got kinetic friction. As long as your wheel is still moving, turning, you actually have static friction acting between the tire and the road. Each point on the wheel is maintaining a grip on the, on the road. That's static friction. And static friction is bigger than kinetic. That's why even when we're trying to stop, we want our wheels to keep moving. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? In order to stop your car quicker, you want your wheels to keep moving because friction between the tire and the road is bigger when that's the case. Okay. Um, and here's one for you. Um, copper on copper is, is pretty big, right? Um, if copper on copper is, is such a big coefficient of friction, why would we not make, make brakes, your brakes for our car out of copper? It, it's going to deform. Right? It, it gets hot and it changes shape too easily. So, yeah, it works really well. You're driving down a highway in the mountains, you're going down a hill, you put your brakes on quite a bit, right? Because you're because you don't want to go out of control down the hill. You get to the bottom of the hill, you got to do a brake job. And then the mechanic does your brake job and says, yeah, you be careful on the next hill. Drive up the next hill, go down, and uh, need another brake job. Massive, massive creative brakes in the trunk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's not practical, obviously, right, because it changes shape too easily. So it's a trade-off, right? We have a lower coefficient of friction, which makes us, takes it longer to stop, but the brakes last for... 70, 80,000 kilometers instead of one hill that you're going down. What about this one? Do you guys know what synovial fluid is? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a fluid that's in your joints that keeps your joints from doing this. Squeak, squeak, squeak as you move them back and forth. Not only would that be really annoying every time you, every time you do this, it would really hurt really badly. So our bodies have this synovial fluid, which has a ridiculously low coefficient of friction, static and kinetic, to reduce friction between our joints to almost nothing, virtually nothing. Makes sense? OK, let's do a question. This question says, uh, a sled with waxed hickory runners, like wood, it's a type of wood. So this is like an old time sled. This is like, this is like, um, this is like Santa sled right here. This is like Rudolph pulling, uh, pulling the old, I think, I think Santa has like rockets on the back of his sled now, but back in the old days, it was waxed hickory, hickory runners. Horizontal, dry, snowy surface. North Pole is pretty dry, right? Like it's lots of snow, but pretty pretty low humidity. So he's sitting on this dry, snowy surface. Uh, what's the mass of the sled if the maximum force that can be applied to the sled before it starts moving is 46 newtons? Um, what's going on here? Maximum force that can be applied to the sled before it starts moving is 46 newtons. Let's go back here, actually. At what point did this did this object start moving? 50 newtons, 50.1 or whatever, right? We'll say 50 newtons. Okay. So the maximum force that I have, that, that, uh, or the force that I had to apply to get it moving was 50 newtons, right? So that corresponds to the max force of static friction, right? The force that I had to apply to get it moving, 50 newtons, that's the max force of static friction. Read this question again. The mass of the sled, if the maximum force that can be applied to the sled before it starts moving is 46 newtons. What do I have given to me there, that 46? That's the maximum force of static friction, FSF 
max. I apply a force of 30, doesn't move. Static friction is 30. I apply a force of 45, doesn't move. Static friction is 45. I apply a force of 46. Well, that's the force I got to apply to get it moving. Static friction is, well, really 45.99, whatever, right? But we'll say 46. Whenever you apply a force to get it moving, that's FSF max. When you apply a force when it is moving already, we're talking about FKF, the force of kinetic friction. Okay, what else we got here? Um, that's it, I think. I'm going to say FSF max is equal to mu times the normal force. And the normal force, we said, for us, as long as it's a horizontal surface, is going to be the same as gravity. So I'm going to say it's m times g, m times a, m times 9.81, but since it's specific to gravity, we'll call it g. Wax hickory runners on a dry, snowy surface. Wax hickory runners on a dry, snowy surface. We're talking about static friction here, right? 0 0.06. Notice it's quite a bit, quite a bit higher for if it's wet snow. Who skis it? Do you like skiing in dry snow or wet snow? Dry, dry snow, right? Why? Because the coefficient of friction for dry snow is a lot less. Right? So, so your skis don't stick to the snow. That's right. You don't get wet when you fall down. 0 0.06 is the, is the coefficient of static friction here. So let's find M here now, the mass of this sled, the mass of Santa's sled. Solving for mass, solving for mass, we take mu and gravity over by dividing. FSF max is 46 newtons, mu is 0 0.06, and g is 9.81. Remember, we're dropping the sign here. Forty-six divided by brackets, point zero six times nine point eight one gives me seven point eight times ten to the one, that's in scientific notation already. Seventy-eight newtons. Seventy-eight point one five newtons. Or uh, kilograms I should say. Curly Santa is not on this slide yet. Otherwise it would weigh much more than seventy eight newtons. How many digits should I round this to? I'll, I'll wait to acknowledge until I hear a correct answer. It's not two. It's one. Doesn't count, doesn't count. One digit, right? So we'd actually make that eight times 10 to the one kilograms. I'm sorry? No, it's original data because, I, I mean, I wrote it down, but in the end, I needed the information that came from this table, which is the same as if it was written in this data, in this information right there. So it counts, yeah. Now, if it was written down on here as 0 0.060, and I wrote it down as 0 0.06, we go back to the original 0 0.060. So you're going to have a couple questions to work on in just a moment here. If you're given the force required to get it moving, that's maximum force of static friction. If you're dealing with a force after it's already moving, then you're dealing with kinetic friction. All right? Let's see what we can do with the questions on page 185. I put the table up there so that you don't have to keep flipping back and forth. Okay? In the end, uh, on an exam, again, you need to be given the table or the numbers in the table. See what you can do here.